Project Palisade, Part 1. What would you sacrifice to protect those you care about? While that may sound like the tagline for a bad action movie, it is an interesting question nonetheless. The SCP Foundation and its members know a good deal about sacrifice, with one of their common mottos being, We die in the dark so that you can live in the light. They've sacrificed D-Class, researchers, field agents, and sometimes even civilians, all in the pursuit of protecting humanity. Project Palisade is yet another scenario in which the Foundation faces the threat of mass extinction, and they have to ask themselves exactly how much they're willing to sacrifice. Project Palisade begins with a file written up by the FBI's Unusual Incidents Unit, detailing an anomalous individual that suddenly manifested inside of a government facility. There are a couple odd things about this file, starting with the fact that the Foundation obtained it from SCP-1437, an endless hole that connects to an unknown number of parallel dimensions. So far, they've only obtained files through SCP-1437 that were written by the Foundations of other universes, so getting a UIU file is rather strange. Secondly, the document opens with the UIU referring to the Foundation as an anomalous, terrorist organization, when normally the UIU is on pretty good terms with the Foundation. The individual described in the file is a male that was wearing Foundation-issued fatigues at time of initial arrest, and only offered his name as Agent Duma. Duma suddenly manifested in the middle of Fort Hoover, with the UIU suspecting that he possesses some form of anomalous teleportation capabilities although he has yet to teleport or disappear since. He seems to be a Foundation agent, but the Foundation completely denied Duma's existence, possibly meaning that Duma is a now disavowed clandestine agent. The UIU have done some extensive interrogation to determine Duma's motivations for coming here, but so far he's been silent, although he's cooperative otherwise. He seems to be especially resistant to threats of punishment or withholding of privileges, for reasons unknown. The fatigues he was wearing bear some insignias that don't match the design of any known Foundation division, and when he manifested, he was carrying a cardboard box filled with non-anomalous dirt, again for reasons unknown. When Duma manifested in Fort Hoover, he initially made an attempt to escape from the facility, critically injuring four UIU members in the process. After capture, though, he stopped offering any form of resistance, and hasn't contested any of the criminal charges they've brought against him, such as violating the Anomalous Individual Existence Act. The UIU of this dimension seems to be undergoing some intense hostilities with the Foundation, but during a brief pause, Duma was offered up as part of a hostage exchange. The Foundation refused, as they claimed to have never heard of him. Sometime later, Fort Hoover was attacked by the Foundation after the failure of the UIU's Operation Heavenfall to encircle Foundation forces in the Midwest. The MTFs that went in managed to free a number of captured individuals, but even though they had ample chance to free Duma, they chose not to. The rest of the document is written by 2nd Lieutenant James Finch, who was assigned to monitor the anomalous capabilities of Duma. Finch was a little mystified as to why the Foundation has completely ignored him, even passing up the chance to free him when they could. Things were made a bit clearer after the UIU cracked open some encrypted data, discovering that Agent Duma real name Yehuda Mizrachi, actually died four years prior from a rogue anomaly. Since they've been trying to ransom a dead man, it makes sense why the Foundation wouldn't want him, but it doesn't clear up who or what exactly they have locked up in a cell currently. Apparently anomalies have been leveling cities recently, so the UIU doesn't care that much about a single individual they have locked up. Finch plans on continuing to dig to find out though. Later, Finch realizes that the UIU has made a pretty big mistake in classifying Duma as an anomalous individual. 
He used some of the tech that they've taken from the Foundation on Duma to try and measure him, but nothing comes up, suggesting that either he's powerful enough to trick the sensor, or he's not anomalous. Finch prefers to think that he's simply not anomalous, but mentions that if the situation in Asia gets any worse, it might all be moot anyways. He doesn't think that Duma is a covert agent, as the Foundation would have either rescued him or silenced him just to tie up loose ends. If he's not a covert agent and he's not anomalous, Finch wonders how a dead man is sitting in their cells. Finch goes to Duma and confronts him with the information that he's not anomalous, threatening to take that info to the higher-ups in the UIU. If Duma isn't actually anomalous, they have no reason to keep him around, and instead they'll just execute him. Duma instead laughs off the threat, saying that he gave himself up as a dead man as soon as he arrived in this world. His job is finished, his home is safe, and he's held up the bargain. When Finch asks him what he means, Duma simply says that he's added another stake to the palisade. Finch presses him further for explanations, and Duma says that in classical Aramaic, Duma is the word for silence, and in his faith, Duma is the angel of silence, an aspect of death. Duma is the voice whispering in your ear when the end is near, the voice telling you that it will all be over in a flash. He won't tell the UIU the truth because they can't stop what has already been set into motion. With the end so near, it's better to be silent, so that they may accept the end with as little pain as possible. Later, Finch updates the file and says that half the eastern seaboard of the United States just disappeared, as if someone pressed delete in Photoshop. They tested the air where Philadelphia used to be, and found traces of some extra-dimensional matter permeating the area. They then ran some tests on everything in their storage to see if they got any matches using the foundation tech, and they ended up finding a 100% match between the extra-dimensional matter and the dirt from the cardboard box Duma brought with him. Whatever is in the air where the eastern US used to be came from the same dimension as the dirt. Finch doesn't know what's happening, or what Duma did to their world, and when he wants to go speak with Duma again, he found him dead in his cell, apparently from self-strangulation, although he has no idea how he managed that either. Finch has no answers, no leads, and no time, and begs someone to save their world. So. In an alternate universe where the UIU is at war with the Foundation, and seems to be doing far better than one would expect of the UIU, a Foundation agent from yet another alternate universe suddenly showed up and somehow caused the eastern US to disappear. He referred to this act as adding another stake to the palisade, and implied that he did this to keep his own universe safe. In the next file, an individual sits on the stoop of an apartment building while watching people go in and out of a building across the street. He's almost certain that it's a Foundation-controlled building, and he'd already infiltrated one other Foundation facility and stolen some anti-telepathy gear from them. He eventually walks over and enters the building using a door code he observed, finding a slightly decaying lobby. He notes that all of the mailbox doors look dusty and if the Foundation wanted to hide in plain sight, they'd have to do a better job of covering the little details. He calls the elevator, and when it arrives, two men carrying handguns exit and begin sweeping through the lobby. They don't seem to notice the man, who steps into the elevator. One of the men remarks that nobody is here, to which the other says, yes, he's sure. The man in the elevator notices that there's no button for floor 13, and presses both the 12 and 14 buttons as the other men notice that the doors are closing. This man is an individual known only as Nobody, an individual defined by their mysteriousness and inscrutability. Nobody is not necessarily a single person, but rather a designation that changes hands from time to time and they tend to have their fingers in a lot of pies, so to speak, sometimes helping the Foundation, 
and sometimes hindering them. It seems nobody has a way of concealing himself from view, but now the Foundation knows that they have an intruder somewhere in the facility. Upon the elevator arriving on the 13th floor, the doors open to a flurry of bullets, with nobody hiding to the side before crawling out from underneath the gunfire. He then stood and stepped over to the receptionist's desk, keeping an eye on the four guards still staring down the elevator. Looking at a laptop on the desk, nobody notes that an email was sent to everyone here informing them that Director Kondraki was planning to visit tomorrow for some reason. Nobody really wanted to get further into the facility, so he walked back to the elevator and sent it down another floor. The guards holstered their weapons and asked command if the whole thing wasn't a malfunction, since the elevator just went down a floor and nobody was on it. Of course, nobody wasn't on it, and instead he followed two of the guards through a locked door into a small security room. To get through a further door, nobody resorted to using a small tablet created by the factory group, noting that while it has its uses, the cost to use it was distasteful. He held up the tablet to his eye as a tiny needle stabbed into it in order to get a DNA confirmation sample. He remarks that everything this tablet can do is technically possible with non-anomalous technology, but its speed and precision make it likely that it uses some sort of time-warping anomaly. Using the tablet, nobody manages to disable all the power in the room, opening the magnetic locks on the door, which he steps through. Whatever he did seemed to have activated a security drill across the site, forcing all the Foundation personnel inside to rush out, leaving him free to explore. He utilizes the tablet again to enter into a secure server room, finding a terminal that listed all of the projects managed by the site. Most of it nobody regarded as rather boring, until he comes across a folder containing files locked behind O5 Access, which is rather surprising in such a minor site. Nobody uses the tablet a third time to copy the files over and begin decrypting them, and makes his way back out of the site. As he steps out of the server room, however, he walks into a squad of fully equipped MTF agents, wearing perceptual filter goggles. Nobody slowly raises his arms, but they quickly subdue him with a stun gun, and he falls unconscious. He wakes up in a Foundation interrogation room, stripped to his underwear. He's able to look through the one-way mirror and notices a man in a military uniform standing there, a major general in the U.S. Army with the name General Mulhausen on his ID card. Nobody questions where he's heard that name before, and for those in a similar situation, General Mulhausen was the individual responsible for a massacre of civilians in order to cover up the existence of SCP-002, a fact I brought up in my Department of Abnormalities video. A man in a lab coat enters the interrogation room and yells at nobody, asking him who he is, who he's working for, and why was he after the files for Project Palisade. Nobody simply says that he's nobody, but the man says nobody is just an urban legend told to spook rookies. Nobody replies that he's not working for anyone but his own curiosity, as the Foundation always has the most interesting tidbits. He also taunts them by saying that they didn't hide the place very well, especially compared to Site-19. The man grows angrier, stating that nobody has ever infiltrated 19, to which nobody smiles and says, exactly. A woman gently pushes the man in the lab coat aside and thanks nobody for bringing them a coat with a Notice Me Not lattice woven into it, and a copy of the factory's latest generation of tech. She's also curious, though, why he beelined straight to their secure files if he was just sightseeing, asking him what exactly he was hoping to find. Nobody says that it was simply luck on his part that he ended up there, and asks about Project Palisade. The man in the lab coat growls and says that, of course they're going to just tell him about their reality firewall program that uses alternates for research purposes. 
Nobody smiles and says you can't blame a guy for asking, but the woman says that she can and tells the man that he's been compromised by some sort of anomaly. The man rushes out to get whatever effect nobody put on him removed, and the woman says that she's naturally immune to most anomalous compulsion effects, which is part of why she has her job. She is also under the effect of some sort of anti-perceptual anomaly, so nobody couldn't retain any sort of impression of her in his mind. He says that he's telling the truth. He had no real agenda coming here other than to poke around, but thanks to them, he's now aware of a special project of theirs that sounds very interesting. She says that that seems plausible at least, but wants to dive a little deeper, injecting him with a yellow fluid. Nobody wakes up on a park bench sometime later with a splitting headache and the taste of amnestics in his mouth. Normally a person would have no idea what happened to them, but as nobody rubbed his temples, the memories of the last week came back to him. He's never been interrogated quite that thoroughly before, suggesting that Project Palisade is a really big deal for the Foundation. He couldn't really glean anything from lip reading or body language, but he could tell that the woman was bothered that he hadn't given her any co-conspirators. They had given him most of his stuff back, although they had swapped the tablet with a last generation model. He'll have to ditch all of it in case there's trackers, and he'll have to use his abilities to disappear off the Foundation's radar completely. A month later, he sits in a coffee shop in a different city, scrolling through a laptop he had stolen from a careless Foundation researcher a while back. The files that he had found in the site about Project Palisade were inside of a folder labeled as R.I. Class. Looking through the database of Foundation disaster classifications, he notices that R.I. Class is their designation for a reality incursion slash invasion scenario. He notes that this explains a few things he overheard in the Wanderer's library. He also takes another look at the documentation for the anti-telepathy helmet he stole, finding an interesting memo. The memo mentions something referred to as Fence Post Cluster MNT 9T3, suggesting it to be an alternate dimension or timeline. It seems that the Foundation here is well aware of the corruption of dimensions, and Project Palisade is an effort to protect them from it. The Foundation of the Normal Timeline had their own instance of an individual suddenly manifesting in one of their facilities, designated as SCP-3818. 3818 is a perfect doppelganger of Agent David Hawk, who suddenly manifested in Hawk's bed while the original was asleep. When they both woke, they began fighting until a security guard intervened and they were both placed in containment. The doppelganger is an exact identical match to the original, down to DNA, previous injuries, memories, allergies, and personalities. Both believe themselves to be the original, and neither one has any idea how the other appeared, nor does the Foundation. Sometime after being contained, a containment breach occurred at their site, as an SCP rampaged through the facility. A number of containment systems, surveillance systems, and backup power systems experienced failure during the time, including all of the humanoid containment cells. Most of the humanoids stayed in their cells for their own safety, but both instances of Agent Hawk left for unknown reasons. They were eventually found afterwards in another containment chamber, with one of them dead. The other had wounds indicating a fight with the loose SCP, as well as close quarters combat. The cause of the breach is currently unknown. While this might seem to be a rather unrelated SCP, when viewing it as part of the bigger picture, we can see some clues. We know that we're dealing with parallel universes, and some of these universes are becoming corrupted for some reason. Based on Duma's box of dirt, it seems that if some material from a corrupted universe is brought to a regular one, it slowly starts to corrupt and destroy the new universe. 
It would seem that the copy of Agent Hawk that arrived here came from a corrupted universe somehow, and either he himself or something he brought with him has started to corrupt this universe. It's not clear which of the two Hawks died, as likely the Foundation doesn't even know which one is the original, and it's also not clear if killing the corrupted Hawk would save the universe or not. We're given further information about the problem in a document written up by five of the Black Queens, the designation that the daughter of Dr. Gears gives to herself. She had found a way to establish communication with her alternate selves across parallel dimensions, with all of them referring to themselves as Black Queens or Little Sisters. The document features five of them discussing the corruption of dimensions, starting by saying that the problem stems from matter from a corrupted or infected space-time construct, or dimension. This matter is typically inanimate, massing between 5 and 50 kilograms, but can also be a living creature. If it's alive, it will be associated with the Foundation in some way. The Queens bicker about whether or not to label this as a form of virus, and whether or not this corrupted material is only a small part of the larger process. They're trying to figure out what exactly are the prerequisites for this corruption in a specific dimension or timeline. So far, they've found that the Foundation has to exist in the dimension as a unified worldwide entity, and para-universal technology has to exist in some form. Some of them believe that this technology has to only be restricted to the Foundation and or the GOC, but others think that this isn't necessarily required. Also, they found that most of the dimensions feature red-green color blindness in at least 1% of the global population, but they're not sure if this is a coincidence or a prerequisite. They move on to discussing the potential utility of such a process, with one queen stating that it's acceptable as a weapon of last resort to destroy recalcitrant timelines. She's quickly rebuked by the others though, with one saying that they don't even know how to use it as a weapon, or if it even is a weapon, or if it can be used without backlash on the user. One of them mentions that she's seen evidence that the corrupted materials might be part of a ritual that simply attracts something else, possibly an outside entity. It might also act as a diversion of destruction to another target, saving one universe to damn another. This falls very strongly in line with what Duma stated. One of the queens apparently found information in the Wanderer's library that describes the process as a weapon, or at least it's part of a weapon. They agree at least to not destroy any timelines using the process if only because they can't be sure of any repercussions, but they keep it in their back pocket just in case. Continuing on with how to stop the process once initiated, one of them says that trying to remove the corrupted material by putting it into a new timeline will only taint the new timeline, not save the previous one, although it does extend the life of the timeline by a variable amount of time. Another queen says that this fits in with her attraction theory, that something is directly causing these destructions, and the corrupted material just attracts it, changing the order of which universes it destroys. If this were just some arcane ritual that was destroying universes, removing the corrupted material would surely disrupt it, but since it doesn't, it's likely the destroying entity just gets pulled away temporarily. They continue by discussing several timelines that they've observed, all of which are currently corrupted. The offending material in timeline M37 is Foundation Agent Melissa Hargrove, who originated in timeline Q17, along with her personal technology. The timeline normally features steampunk technology so Agent Hargrove's advanced technology from her original timeline allows her to perform as a cult leader in the southwestern United States of Europe. Apparently none of the queens are fans of Agent Hargrove, 
so they decide to just let this timeline die without further investigation. In timeline L03, only a few paranatural organizations exist, with the primary players being the Global Occult Foundation, MC&D Labs, and the Wonder Factory. Anomalous individuals are openly accepted by both the public and the GOF, and the offending material is an iron ingot owned by MC&D Labs. One of the queens snuck into their lab to look at the ingot, finding it to be utterly normal, which makes her wonder how many timelines are actually corrupted by materials that they're not even aware of yet. Timeline P99 is highly unstable, with more than 5,000 anomalies known to exist, placing it in the 97th percentile of universes. All of the paranormal groups there call themselves variations on chess-related terminology, with the Foundation equivalent called the Red Bishops, the Global Occult Commission called the White Knights, the Horizon Initiative called the Pawns of God, and etc. The offending material is an anomalous but harmless pizza box contained by the Red Bishops. Apparently, this timeline is so unstable that the Red Bishops have devised a way to directly measure the degree of decay, and created machinery to reinforce local reality, with the queens agreeing to steer clear of this one. One of them wonders if the general instability of the universe has anything to do with why it became corrupted, or if it was completely stable, would it have become corrupted and died anyways? Timeline Q165 is familiar to us, as the UIU is in charge of things here, where the US government acknowledged the existence of anomalies and outlawed most anomalous groups as terrorist organizations. The corrupting material here is a box of dirt, as we know. In Timeline Z24, there exists a unified faith devoted to the worship of anomalies as divine gifts known as the United Church of the Chosen Heralds. Their main temple is built around a chest filled with corrupted dirt, or rather it did exist as it has already been completely destroyed. They note that the time between the chest of dirt showing up and the timeline getting destroyed is less than a year. They discuss the significance of multiple timelines being corrupted by dirt with one suggesting that someone is using dirt because there's a lot of dirt in existence. Another brings up the fact that ritual magic and similar powers are much better performed on Earth than on air. Timeline J341's corrupted material is a Pembroke Welsh Corgi living in Portland, which they note as being a viable test subject to see what happens when a living trigger is killed. One of the queens discusses her dissatisfaction with the idea of killing a dog, but the others all agree that one dog's life is worth billions. One of the queens ends up killing the dog, but there doesn't seem to be any change in the overall destruction of the timeline. She also notes that the portal, or way, that she originally planned on using as her exit no longer functions. The text for the next timeline entry, discussing A930, seems to have been largely removed, leaving one queen saying, Enough of this. It is past time we took action. Another queen comments asking if this entry was removed, as she's just catching up. She asks what happened, as no one has been responding since discussing J341. One of the other queens finally responds, telling her that she thinks they're the last two around, and that she figured it out. The other queens are apparently either gone or dead, and she shares some files with the other queen discussing Project Palisade. She leaves off by telling the other one that this one is probably never getting resolved, and suggests she get out of this cluster while she still can. Let's recap what we know then. Parallel timelines, or universes, however you want to look at it, are being destroyed one by one. These timelines all share some traits. 
One being that the Foundation exists as a global organization in all of them. Two being that technology exists allowing communication or travel between universes. And three being that all of them contain some material from a universe that is now destroyed. The exact cause of what's destroying these universes is not made clear yet, although signs point to it being some sort of entity. The foundation of the main timeline seems to be aware of this, establishing something known as Project Palisade to help protect them. The concept of a palisade was referenced by Agent Duma before he killed himself, with him being a visitor to an alternate timeline. He brought along with him a box of dirt from a destroyed universe but his comments imply that he did this purposefully in order to save his own universe, suggesting that he didn't bring the dirt from his own universe. The Black Queens seem to imply that there are multiple clusters of timelines in existence, and it's possible to evade this threat by just moving to a different cluster, although that's not likely what Project Palisade is. As for what exactly it is, we'll find out in the second part.